I would plead for consideration on behalf of the drivers who have undertaken to drive to Brighton. Today is a most auspicious occasion. Motor cars have today been granted the freedom of the road. Gentlemen, let us show the world what we can do on the road to Brighton. Britain's first proper motor dealer, Harry Lawson, resplendent in a uniform of his own design, organised the so-called London to Brighton Emancipation Run. To celebrate the fact that it was no longer necessary to have a man walking in front of your car with or without a red flag. The brakes were off. The motor car would never be the same again. Determined teams from France, Britain and the United States set off down the long road to Brighton, only to be mobbed by crowds startled at seeing cars travelling at death-defying speeds, sometimes as much as 14 miles an hour. One hundred years later in a very wet and drizzly Hyde Park and that first moment is still being celebrated. That moment when the motor car was liberated, when it threw off that first piece of killjoy legislation. Amazingly, nearly 700 cars have turned up to do this London to Brighton centenary run. They were all made before 1904, December the 31st, and there are some cars here that actually took part in that original run. If you want to see raw car enthusiasm, motoring love to a point of dementia it is here this is car enthusiasm gone completely and utterly barking mad the car was made in 1884 it's a de dion bouton a trepardu it's a coke fired steam car it'll take over an hour to get the car up to pressure and then uh, hopefully on our way down to brighton i did try um in the late 80s with the car never succeeded in getting there but we we're determined to do so this year. This Panhard Lavassa shaking at the start line actually took part in that very first run. But while brave souls cope with the dawn drizzle, I shall cover the route in the grace and favour of a more modern machine with such luxuries as a roof. Not so, however, are two fearless and rather moist reporters. Right, this is my chariot of fire. It's an 1898 Leon Bollet. It's got all the three horsepower, built in Paris, and it's the original backseat driver. This is my pal, Andy Watt. Now, Andy, yesterday, somebody gave me this sovereign. Last year, we did the event in seven and a half hours. If we can beat it, we get to keep this. So don't spare the horses. No problem. All three of them. I'm going to be covering the almost 60 miles to Brighton in this Coventry-built Daimler. It was built in 1899. It was considered very much the top-of-the-range model at the time. It's 3-litre, 12-horsepower engine will actually manage something up to sort of 30 miles an hour. In fact, it's one of the first British cars to compete in a foreign race. It costs £775 new, but let me tell you, you didn't get an awful lot of luxury for that. It's going to be a rather wet ride to Brighton. the words old car and one very famous name leaps to mind. 
a man who has devoted his life to the preservation of our motoring bloodline, Lord Montagu of Bewley. We sent Michel, passengering him in his 1899 Daimler, down to Bewley to find out exactly how this passion started. In 1951, when I first opened the house of the pub for the first time, when I came to commemorating my father's life, he dedicated his life to the motor car and roads. I thought, well, let's have a little memorial to my father. So I got three or four cars together, put them in the front hall of the house, made the whole house smell of oil, <laughs> and from those very small beginnings, almost like an acorn, a great oak tree has grown. And I started I'm really bitten by the bug of collecting, and they thought that the film Genevieve came out a year later, and the public interest was enormous. And then the cars started to flow into the cellars and the yeah. kitchens and back passages, and, uh, and then she was ended up being the National Motor Museum in 1972. It's a very famous car because it was my father's second car, which he bought in 1899. It's the first four-cylinder Daimler ever made. It is the first car ever to race on the continent driven by Lynchman. It took King Edward for a very famous drive here in the New Forest when he was Prince of Wales. And he had these very pretty girls in the back as his wound with big hats on. And the king said at the end, you ladies have got to get new types of fashion now that motor cars arrive. A very perceptive remark. Now, what about the rest of your family? They too are involved now, aren't they? Yes, well, the whole family are driving cars on the Brighton Run. And uh, my oldest son in a 93 day, well, he's more interested in railways, really. Uh, and my youngest son is doing his debut in the Dijon Bouton. And my daughter marries in the latest team. Britain's oldest racing car, 1980, so I hope they'll all get there. But regrettably, Lady Mary Montagu didn't finish. She broke down in Red Hill and never crossed the line. In fact, many of the contestants were beginning to show their antiquity, and we're talking the cars, not the drivers. The road to Brighton was lined with owners forced to get out and get under. A bit of engine tool. One of the valves has gone underneath or something. Absolutely peculiar. Nor were breakdowns any respecter of nationality. Vorsprung Dirk Technik was still a long way off. Where do we get there? Oh, yes, we are. There are three Leon Bollies in the event this year, and two of them are here at this service station at Red Hill. They're suffering from a sticking inlet valve, we're suffering from a sticking exhaust valve. So, if the worst comes to the worst, we can always cobble together one good car from the two. Now, I've been having to get out of the car and run alongside it at points, and uh, there's a hill just up here where we're both going to have, a, have to get out of the car. Now, you might say to yourself, well, how does he drive it? And the answer, of course, is with great difficulty. Okay, hold it over one. <laughs> we have to walk up this one. And if you think car enthusiasm is a modern day phenomenon, think again. A hundred years ago, people were crafting their own crazy confections. Yes, it's not a veteran car. It's also not what you might think it is. It is, in fact, a replica car. Built by George here with his own fair hands. A sort of do-it-yourself job. Now, there were do-it-yourself cars around at the turn of the century. But I wonder what they look like. Ah, oh, what's this, George? Well, this is an English mechanic. And it was built in 1900 from a series of articles in a magazine called The English Mechanic and World of Science. And it even went into remarkable detail, showing you how to make a pattern, to make a sand casting, to get your cylinder cast. But even for the turn of the century, this wasn't exactly a luxury car, was it? No, it was pretty primitive even then. How fast? Well, it does sort of 10 to 12 miles an hour, 
and probably a little bit better with the following wind and downhill. So it's not got one of these great four litre engines or anything like that? No, it's all of three horsepower. Where's the motor? Well, the motor's in the rear. Shall we have a look at it? We'll, we'll, yeah. <laughs> You don't need a rev counter, do you? Just just fingers, really. Yes, you can count it <laughs> count it in your head. So what have we got here? Well, this is a single cylinder engine, and it's belt drive, which gives you two forward speeds and no reverse. Difficult to drive? No, it's very easy. Can I have a go? You certainly can. Give us the keys then. Right. Get this in there. Just waiting round. Trying to lose a finger in the process. <laughs> And with one what mighty heave, this thing should go. <laughs> Chance to be a fine thing. Yes. <laughs> right, on we go. Right, what right. do I need to do? Now, you want to build up the ribs. Yeah. And then just ease that forward. Well, very good so far. I'm touching some wood in my steering wheel. Um, I, I reflect really that um, in a modern car under sort of, sort of rush hour conditions, it would take just as long to get here as we have now. Our only regret, in fact, is that no one's brought a flask of coffee or anything even stronger. But uh, I guess I wouldn't be allowed anyway. We'll have to wait for our first stop at Crawley, which isn't that far away. You need to understand that back then there were no AA patrols, service stations or little sheds. You bought your petrol from a chemist, ground your valves at a village blacksmith and mended your punctures where you could. To see how turn-of-the-century motoring was a triumph of tenacity over resources, we dispatched Tony Mason, a man not quite old enough to remember for himself. So we're in a 1903 car. What was it like driving on the roads in 1903? Well, very different from, from the roads of today because they were all loose surfaced, apart from in towns. And presumably no signposts? No signposts whatsoever, so you had to imagine your way along the road and, and it was uh, travelling hopefully and then perhaps you arrived. And how did you find your way around? Any maps or anything? Uh, there were maps produced mainly for cyclists, but of course they quickly adapted those for, for motorists. And uh, in 1903, books like this were produced, which isn't a book of common prayer, but uh, has, has the uh, maps in it and uh, all the gradients showing where uh, one uh, had to be aware of going down steep hills rather than worrying too much about going up them. It's all very cosy in here, not much room at all. What about luggage? Uh, luggage was uh, tended to be sent on by rail and uh, that was then going to get there. But you might not get there, of course. No, and of course, <laughs> if you didn't get there, then not only had you got all the materials that you needed for the car to keep that in uh, good working order or to repair it when it went wrong, but you also had sustenance for the uh, passengers and driver. And uh, uh, Frank Hedges Butler, who was a very uh, an early pi a pioneer motorist, he um, reckoned that you needed to travel with at least two bottles of dry sherry, and uh, with, with a packet of biscuits with you, so that if things went wrong, you could uh, stop by the roadside and at least while the chauffeur was dealing with the car, the uh, passengers were well looked after. Oh, all right. Well, let's have a bit of this then. That's good, isn't it? It is indeed, yes. Um, free breathalyzer days, of course. Well, exactly. So the driver could have one. Indeed. Great. You've got all sorts of bits and pieces, and what on earth are those things down there? Well, those actually are what the early motorists called bombs. In fact, we call them bangers now. And because of the problems with dogs chasing motor cars, if you're prepared to light one of these and throw it about the back, Seriously? we'll get rid of that. Yes, indeed.
I'm in Crawley and it's now 9.30 and the first cars are trundling in, having taken an agonising two hours to cover the 30 miles from Hyde Park Corner. Crawley is significant because up the road is the George Hotel, which was traditionally always the place where the walking wounded could stop and mend the magnetos and fix their punctures. But on the original run, Frank Lawson, ever the gentleman, arranged lunch for everybody in Reigate. But the French, who are not gentlemen, decided to skip lunch and cheat, getting an unfair advantage. Not cricket at all. Uh, I was in, a, in another car, <laughs> which didn't get beyond the starting line, so I transferred to the chairman's car, which is driven by Sterling Moss, so it can't be bad. Very direct steering. Um, I have a little bit of a problem sometimes in the gearbox, finding exactly where the gears are. And, uh, but having said that, it's really very nice. No one gets the hang of it. It's my first time, I'm sure. I mean, when uh, this is people driving, it does a much better job than I do. Stood up to Lord Montague's driving remarkably well, which is incredible because he's driven it not like a, a vintage car but like something more like a modern car. It's been really great fun, though I have to say it's incredibly uncomfortable and it does serious damage to your bladder. Um, but it's been a good ride, we're halfway there, and uh, hopefully we'll get there without breaking down. <laughs> Pit stopping for petrol, oil, water, coffee and the odd lump of coal, drivers set off on the final leg to Brighton. But a hundred years ago, the internal combustion engine wasn't the only form of propulsion. Not everybody wanted to start their cars by waving a blowtorch at the worryingly named hot tube ignition. Edwardian motorists could opt for a much safer and gentler form of locomotion, steam. Michelle visited the Science Museum at Rawton, Wiltshire to find out more. Beep, beep. Get your veil and get your duster. Get the yen for goggles when the wind's a guster. Keep your Hubbard gown firmly belted down when you're out in your Stanley steamer. We're driving along in an 1899 Stanley locomobile steam car. The boiler is at the back. It's fired by petrol, which is held in a pressurized tank under our feet. It's got a twin cylinder engine, which drives the rear axle through bicycle chain. Well, by the turn of the century, the late 19th century, steam cars were already really uh, about 100 years old. So right. it was a very proven technology. Steam cars uh, are fast, they accelerate quickly, uh, they're silent, they're easy to drive, very few controls. But hang on, stop the commercial. Come on, why didn't they last? There must have been some reason. Well, there was a problem with the uh, fuel firing. Steam cars did occasionally go up in smoke. Thank you, Alex. And uh, <laughs> also, I think the biggest problem, though, really, was the, the time to start up in the morning. Yeah. Uh, this one, you have to get out of bed about half an hour before you want to go off. Uh, and it's, it's that, really, I think, that, that, that did kill them off. The, you, you couldn't just jump in and drive away. Now, I know you're a huge fan of steam cars, but I mean, electric cars like this one had their followers, too. Yes, they did, indeed. Uh, when this uh, Roberts Electric was made in 1896, uh, electricity must have seemed to be the power of the future. Uh, it was clean, uh, the car was very simple, just tiller steering, uh, a speed control and a foot brake, and cars like this were very popular with lady drivers uh, because of their, their ease of control. And none of that waiting for the steam to build and up. And none of that waiting for the steam <laughs> to build up, no. But what is extraordinary is that, uh, really, that 100 years on, more or less, um, our battery technology is still really no, no further developed. Indeed, this, this car originally had a set of Leclanche cells at the back, which gave it a range of about 30 miles. Uh, even with modern lead-acid batteries, the range at best is about 100 miles. And so the great problem uh, is still uh, the range that you can travel on one charge. And he's just had to relight the fire because as we were flying down this hill, it blew out. We were going too fast. First time all day. For the first time, we were going too fast. <laughs> we did this last year, and it was just the same, except not quite as bad. And we're back to do it again. Why? Because <laughs> we're not. And now we've got to push it to start it, because it yep. doesn't want to go. Well, let's get going. Right. Just, uh... OK. <laughs> Whoa. 
walk now. Now what? Anybody want to buy a man on bollocks? <laughs> Not all the Leon Bollets were perambulating disasters like Steve's, as this 1896 model proved by chugging onto Brighton without missing a single belch. By the turn of the century, cars like this 1901 Lanchester had become almost dependable. Within six years of the emancipation run, power, refinement and performance had improved beyond all recognition. Reliability was getting better all the time too. And there was no better place to prove it than on the racetrack. In 1902, SF Edge drove this 30 horsepower Napier from Paris to Vienna to win the Gordon Bennett Trophy for Britain. Now, by modern standards, that was an incredible feat, especially over unsurfaced roads on these skinny little tyres. Soon after it won that event, the car was shipped to America, where it was gradually modernised over the years. But now it's back in Britain and it's been fully restored with 80% of the parts original. The Gordon Bennett races ran from 1900 to 1905 and, like the Eurovision Song Contest, the winners hosted the next year's event. So in 1903 it came to Britain. Bureaucracy prevented the event being held on the mainland, so it was switched to Ireland. And the three-car Napier team arrived resplendent in a new shade of dark green to honour their hosts. British Racing Green was born. Unfortunately, it didn't bring them much luck. The event was dominated by the white Mercedes of Belgian driver Camille Janatzi. While Napier had increased their power output from 30 to 45 horsepower, this 9.2 litre four-cylinder Mercedes engine produced 60 horsepower and gave a top speed of nearly 80 miles an hour. So what were these cars like to drive? Well, first, you had to dress for the occasion. Now this all sounds rather quiet and nice because that's because this car's in town mode. But the beauty of this old Mercedes is this is an exhaust flap that you can open. And now you're in racing mode. Into neutral, check it, double deep up, and then we're away again. Third gear will take you up to about 45, 50 miles an hour. We're driving on a nice tarmac road where these cars were raced on unmade up park tracks. And they raced them for 350 miles. And the biggest worry for the driver was these skinny little tyres. They had 60 or 70 pounds of pressure in them, but it wasn't a lot of grip. I'm not sure if they understood or overseed. I think they just fell off the road. Racing drivers of the old day are much like those of nowadays, because SF Edge's biggest complaint in Ireland was to his tyre manufacturer for not giving him the right rubber. Racing drivers never change. It's now 10.45 and we are in Brighton at the finish. And even though this is by no stretch of the imagination a race, there is a certain frisson of excitement here to see who crosses the line first. I've watched these crowds all the way down the A23. Look at them. It's like a royal wedding. And first home amid universal jubilation was an 1898 Panhard Lavasa driven by Mike and Barry Timms. Very early car and it's very powerful. And I think that we just got ahead of the traffic and the lights were with us and the policemen were with us as well. And uh, I think that we just didn't get held up and we just kept going. We had a, a one-stop strategy and, and the one stop was bright. With aristocratic elan, Lord Montague piloted both Michelle and his Daimler to an honourable early finish. It's been a really fantastic, fantastic round, hasn't it? Yes, indeed. I think one of the easiest cars there for a long time. It was less tackle on the road. And it was very well marked. I think not helped by the fact that you ignored Mr. Tracker from Montague. We got round the tackle, didn't we, one way or another? You actually drove like a bat out of hell, it has to be said. But it was a very good round. Very traditional. A hundred years ago, it rained like this. And so there's something which is also being celebrated by the weatherman. Very quiet, very modest. Well done.
Thanks, Joe. Stranded at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. After eight hours, no lunch. I had a cup of coffee at five o'clock this morning. I've had nothing to drink since. I've had two sherbet lemons. <laughs> oh no, he's found out to it, both the, both the sherbet lemons. <laughs> One of the day's finest moments was watching this rickety, coke fired, steam driven de Dion Bouton et Trepadou cross the line unscathed. 60 miles from London to Brighton might not sound a lot, but in contraptions like these, it's a sobering feat of extraordinary endurance. Right now, boss. I think it might be boss. I just think it's the grandest automobile event in the world. We're very, very excited to be here and excited to finish. It's a challenge. And also, it's my 44th run. First time from North Carolina. We will be back. So what happened all those years ago in 1896? Well, nobody knows. The French claim that they were first, but they cheated. They skipped lunch. Then the Americans said that they crossed the line before anybody else but being Americans, they would say that. But one thing is absolutely clear, it wasn't all as gentlemanly as you might think. Years later, it was admitted that the electric cars didn't get here under their own power. What happened was they were taken by train, dropped just before the finishing line, smeared with mud to look convincing, and went through with hoots of jubilation. The motor trade, it would appear, has always been dodgy. But there's more. At 7 o'clock on Boxing Day evening, there's motoring eccentricity of a different sort. Jeremy Clarkson looks at Motor World UK. And Jeremy's also back in our normal slot on Thursday, January the 2nd, with a whole programme completely devoted to one of Britain's swishest motors, Aston Martin. Right, well I'm glad you're here. We just can't carry on. It's not the fault of the Leon. Everything that could have gone wrong, gone wrong. We had the exhaust valve sticking and we ran out of gas with a hot tube ignition. Then it just wouldn't start because I think we'd stopped and started so many times it just didn't want to know. It's a very old car. It's done us proud to get this far. We've got to Anstey and the reason we've got to stop, rather obviously, is because it's gone dark and we haven't got any lights. So the sovereign goes back to, uh, back to its owner, but I couldn't care less because I'm now going to get in a modern car, I'm going to drive to Brighton, and we're going to have a pint, aren't we? A pub pint <laughs> and a pint. I am starving. I'm really glad that I participated in the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Run, but it was a bit like banging your head against a brick wall, and I am half glad it's over. <laughs> I'm shattered. <laughs> <laughs> 